Suppose that the percentage change in price is negative 10. The percentage change in quantity demanded is plus 5. Elasticity tells us how much quantity demanded changes with regard to or respect to the change in price. So it's the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. Uh, plus 5 in the numerator, minus 10 in the denominator, or negative 1 half, or negative 0.5, if you like fractions or decimals, same difference. How much quantity demanded changes in response to a change in price. You do the second one. What's the elasticity, price elasticity of demand for the second example? The percentage change in price is plus 2. The percentage change in quantity demanded is minus 4. When the price goes up by 2%, quantity demanded goes down by 4%. What's elasticity equal for the second one? Good, negative 2. Percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. Yeah, question over here. The normal and inferior only applies to income and wealth. So for price, we've got the law of demand, which tells us demand curves always slope down. So we know that there's always an increase in prices giving us a decrease in quantity demand and the other way around. Yep. All right. Terminology is the same. So the, Whoa. In fact, let's not go by that slide quite so fast. The terminology is exactly the same. So you don't have to write this slide down again. It's exactly the same as what we had for income. So if it's perfectly inelastic, it means the elasticity equals zero. If it's perfectly elastic, the elasticity equals infinity. If the elasticity in absolute value is between zero and one, it's relatively inelastic. If the elasticity is greater than one, it's relatively elastic. And then there's that thing in the middle that we rarely see, but we have to define it because it's in the middle. Notice that if the price elasticity of demand is between zero and one. Another way, since the price elasticity of demand, remember, is the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. If the price elasticity of demand is relatively inelastic, another way of saying the same thing is the percentage change in quantity demanded is smaller than the percentage change in price in absolute value. So if we've got relatively inelastic demand, it means that when price goes up a whole lot, there's not a very big drop in the quantity demanded. The percentage change in quantity demanded is smaller than in absolute value, is smaller than the percentage change in price. And when demand is relatively elastic, it means the percentage, demand, the percentage change in quantity demanded is bigger than the percentage change in price. That when there is, say, even a small change in price, there's a big change in the quantity demand, again, an absolute value in response. Question on the side. Perfectly elastic, the bottom one. Perfectly elastic, in this case, would mean if with the tiniest, tiniest increase in price, demand would completely disappear. Or the tiniest, tiniest decrease in price, the demand would become infinitely large. Yeah. And that perfectly inelastic would mean no matter what they do with the price, people are going to buy exactly the same quantity. Question in the front. Can I give an example of something perfectly elastic? In moments. I will get to that in just like on the next slide. Question in the middle. We're getting to that. So the relationship between surplus and elasticity is coming up in about 10 or 15 minutes. All right, oh, one more. Elasticity. So elasticity equal to zero means the percentage change in quantity demanded is zero. So regardless of what happens to the price, there's no change in quantity demanded. That's right. All right. So what are the things that determine the price elasticity of demand, which gets into the examples that we're just asked for? One is the availability of substitutes. The more substitutes there are, the more elastic demand is. So you've got a picture here of the candy rack. And you go up to the candy rack, and some, right, some but not all of these candies are on sale. Right? So Butterfinger's on sale, Baby Ruth is on sale, what is that, Nestle Crunch is on sale, 1,000 grand, 100 grand is on sale, but these other things are not. And so you're getting a decrease in the price of some candy bars, but not in others. Lots and lots of substitutes. People are going to really switch over to the ones that are on sale. Because, you know, yeah, some of us are like, I'm only buying a Mr. Good Bar. I love Mr. Good Bar, and I'm not buying anything else. I don't care. The rest of us, we go in, we're checking out. We're at CVS, which is where you see a thing like this. We want a little bit of chocolate. What are you going to buy? Are you going to buy the one that's on sale or the one that's not on sale? Not if it's Snickers. Not if it's a Snickers, right? Okay, so we got some people with really strong preferences, but a lot of us, we want a little bit of chocolate. We're going to buy the one that's on sale. So there's lots and lots of substitutes. It makes the demand for something much more elastic because you're more happy to switch to the thing that's now cheaper and switch away from the thing that's now more expensive. So the availability of substitutes, the more substitutes there are, the more elastic demand is. Contrasting example, suppose that uh, your health depends upon a drug that's still under, uh, oh, it's not called copyright, but patent. Uh, suppose that your health depends upon a drug that's still under patent. There's no generic drug available that's a substitute for it, so there's no substitute for the drug that you take. Without that drug, you can't do anything. You're sick as a dog and in the hospital. You're going to have relatively elastic or relatively inelastic demand? Relatively inelastic. They jack up the price of that thing, you're going to say, yeah, well, hospital or function, I guess I have to pay it. Second, the share of total spending. The share of total spending. If what you're buying is a relatively small share of your total income or your total spending, then you're not very sensitive to changes in the price. So these little uh, Reese's cups that they put at the counter, the ones that cost a nickel each, a nickel is not very much of our income. If those things were to double in price to a dime, you'd probably grab just as many as you would if they were a nickel. So our quantity demanded is not very responsive to a change in price because a nickel a dime is still not a whole lot of money out of our total budget. It's a small share of our total budget. And when something is a small share of our total budget, our demand is relatively inelastic, price inelastic. On the other hand, you know, five cents to ten cents, that's a doubling. If your rent were to double, for those of you who live off campus, if your rent were to double, you're going to stay in that apartment, you're going to move. You're going to probably move, right? So if you, if you have something that's a really big share of your total budget and that doubles in price, you're going to respond to that. So the larger the share of your budget, uh, the more responsive you are. All right. And then time horizon. The more time you have to change your habits, the more responsive you are to a change in price. That is, the more price elastic demand is. The more time you have to change your habits, the larger the price elasticity of demand. If the price of a gallon of gas went up to $7 a gallon tomorrow, people would be angry. Some people would figure out ways to not drive as much this week. But a lot of people are pretty locked in, right? So they have a 35-mile commute. They don't have any other way to get there. They're going to have to buy the gas. But give them six months or nine months or 12 months, they can find a carpool. They can figure out public transit. They can have different responses to that change in price. The longer the time horizon, the more price elastic is our demand. Those are the three major determinants of price elasticity of demand. Now, one of the applications of price elasticity of demand is it relates to total revenue. Total revenue is the product. Ooh, I'm getting feedback here, Mariko. I don't know where she went. Well, I'll just try not to get feedback. Uh, total revenue is what we get when we multiply price times quantity. That's what we saw in that little uh, graph that I drew a few minutes ago. The total revenue that a seller receives as they change the price depends upon the price elasticity of demand. If there is price elastic demand, so if demand is relatively price elastic, relatively price elastic demand means even if there's a small increase in the price, there's going to be a big decrease 
in a quantity demanded. When demand is relatively price elastic, people are very responsive, very elastic, very responsive. And so a small increase in the price is going to lead to a big decrease in the quantity demanded, which means that the quantity effect, the drop in quantity, is going to, which decreases total revenue, is going to overwhelm the price effect, which is price has gone up and that by itself would increase the total revenue. And the net effect is going to be your total revenue is going to fall. So if you have price elastic demand, a small increase in price gives a big decrease in quantity demanded. That's definition, and it means that the small increase in price is going to lead to a drop in total revenue. You can flip all those arrows over. A small decrease in price, big increase in quantity demanded, gives you an increase in total revenue. If demand is price inelastic, it means that even if there is a big increase in price, it's going to cause only a small decrease in quantity demanded. That's the definition of having price inelastic demand, which means that that increase in price is going to increase total revenue. The higher price, that's the price effect, increases P times Q. The smaller quantity decreases total revenue, but in this case, the price effect dominates the quantity effect, and we get an increase in total revenue. And if we're at that middle spot when there's unitarily elastic demand, uh, an increase in price or a decrease in price, it doesn't really matter, uh, has no effect on total revenue. So the quantity changes in exactly the same proportion as the price change, so you get no change in total revenue. Clicker question. Which of these statements is correct? TR is total revenue. Price cut and inelastic demand makes the total revenue go up. Price increase and elastic demand makes the total revenue go up. Price increase and inelastic demand makes the total revenue go down. Price cut and elastic demand makes the total revenue go up. Or... <laughs> hmm. Look back. Forward. What do you think? Six seconds. One, two, three, four, five... Six. Hmm. I'm getting a little nervous because I keep having the same percentage. I'm still at that 58, 59, 60% percentage. Nine days, nine days, nine days. We're available for help. All right, let's look at some applications of this concept of price elasticity. Here we go. Price elasticity and slope. Generally, most of our demand curves are actually kind of floating out there. They're not really touching the axis. We had those few examples where we had to touch the axis so we could draw in a consumer surplus. But most of the demand curves we look at are not looking at what's happening down at quantities of 0, 1, 2, and 3. Draw yourself on the left a relatively flat demand curve. And on the right, draw yourself a relatively steep demand curve. The one on the left, the relatively flat demand curve, I'm going to leave that D sub elastic. How's that? That's reflecting a relatively elastic demand because even when there is a relatively small change in the price, there's a relatively big change in quantity demanded. So when you have a relatively small percentage change in price and that gives rise to a big percentage change in quantity demanded, we say that demand is relatively elastic. That's going to show up as a relatively flat demand curve. The one on the right that's relatively sleep, steep, sleep, whatever, that's relatively steep, that's how we would reflect demand that's relatively inelastic. Even for a big percentage change in price, there's a very small percentage change in quantity, and that would show up as a relatively steep demand curve. So flat, elastic, steep, inelastic. We can look at the relationship between elasticity and consumer surplus. Let's, oh, I don't have a picture. Ooh. All right, let me go back to this picture. If we look at the relationship between elasticity and consumer surplus on that picture that you just drew, or if you have another set of axes, but I don't seem to have, but maybe you do. Go ahead and let's draw in a supply curve and find the equilibrium point and dash over the price, P star, dash over the price, P star. I think on, if you print it out, the things, isn't there a fresh set of axes or is there not? No? Sorry about that. I hid the slide from all of us. That was silly. It shows right here. It's online. But there you go. All right. Anyway, on the elastic side, the consumer surplus, remember, is the area above the price and below the demand curve. And again, above the price and below the demand curve. Who gets more consumer surplus? Markets are in which markets is there more consumer surplus? Markets in which the demand is relatively elastic, the one on the left, or markets in which the demand is relatively inelastic, the one on the right. Where is there more consumer surplus? Inelastic. Because with inelastic demand, people are willing to pay a much, much, much higher, lots of people are willing to pay a much, much, much higher price than the price they're currently paying. The drug costs currently, say, $20 a month, but heck, you know, you're willing to pay 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 300, 400, 500 dollars a month for that drug. Lots and lots of consumer surplus. On the other hand, if you're not willing to pay much higher price, then the, there's not going to be much consumer surplus, which is what that slide says. All right, burden of tax. Taxes. We drew the picture of taxes at the beginning. The, when we talk about the burden of a tax, we're talking about who's paying the greater percentage of the tax. Well, what we saw was that the price of a good is going to increase from the first price, which we call P1, to some new price, which we call P2. And that was the price that you and I as consumers had to pay. And, but for the, so this is what the consumers face. But from the perspective of the seller, the seller used to retain that price P1 when they sold whatever this good is. But now, even though they're collecting that new price P2 from you and me, they're going to mail the taxes off to the government. And so they're keeping P2 minus the tax. If you need to leave early, you need to sit on the floor in the back because then you won't have to step over seven people to get out. It disrupts not only those seven, but all the people behind them who cannot see what I'm doing. Okay. When we talk about who's bearing the burden of the tax, we're looking at those changes in price and comparing them to the total tax. And so for the consumer's burden, the consumer's burden is the new price they're paying P2 minus the original price they paid P1 divided by the amount of the tax. I'll put some numbers underneath this in just a minute. For the seller, the burden is the, which one's bigger? the original price they charged P1 minus the new price they're receiving and retaining, which is P2 minus the tax. So minus parentheses, P2 minus the tax, close your parentheses. Again, expressed as a percentage of the total tax. Let me put some numbers on it just to give it a little more concreteness. Suppose the original price was um, $4, price P1 was $4, and the price goes up to $5.50 when there's a tax, the tax over here, when there's a tax of $2. In that case, for the consumers, the consumers, they're having to pay $1.50 more when there's a tax of $2, or in their case, that's 75% of the burden. They're paying 75% of the new tax. The seller originally received $4. Now they receive $5.50, but they got to mail $2 immediately off to the government. And so whereas before they had $4 that they got to retain, now it's only $3.50. Again, expressed as a percentage of the tax. The sellers are paying 25%. So we look at how much the price changes and who's paying what burden of the tax. Those burdens, in this case, 75 and 25%, the burden depends upon the relative slopes of supply and demand. Let's play just with the slope of supply, and we'll do that in just a second. This is relevant. Here we go. I forgot what was the next slide. This is relevant in a public policy setting. So here's something that's on the Berkeley ballot. I'm not a Berkeley voter, but many of you are. If you're not re yet registered to vote, I don't know. When is the deadline to register to vote? Do we know? Who knows? Has it passed? When's the, what month is the election? Oh, good. November. In the back, when's the deadline to register? 
October 20th. All right. October 20th is the deadline to register to vote. You can register to vote in your home, your residence, your home residence, or you can register to vote in Berkeley. You cannot vote in both. All right. You can't double vote. You can vote one place or the other. If you're registered at home, then somebody's going to have to get you an absentee ballot, which they mail to you. If you're registered here in Berkeley, you're going to vote someplace, I think, typically on campus if you're living in the dorms. Uh, so there's a ballot measure coming up on the Berkeley ballot in November, which is measure D, which is a soda tax. And the question is, should there be a one cent per ounce tax on soda pop, on Coke, Sprite, ginger ale, that kind of thing? Does this sound familiar at all to anybody? Okay, good. The people in the Monday, Wednesday sections are like, yeah. The people in the Tuesday, Thursday, why should you ask them? Yes, okay. So if, I hope that's not true. I hope it's familiar to everybody. So if, if the question is, should the voters approve Measure D, that's a normative question. We can't answer that question. If the question is, what's the effect of approving Measure D, that's positive economic analysis. We can do that. The should is normative, the what's the effect is positive economic analysis, and we can do that. What we're going to find is that both the burden of the tax and the quantity effect depend upon the price elasticity of demand. Price on the vertical, quantity on the horizontal. Draw on both ones. Draw an initial supply, S1, try to make them exactly the same. Draw on a second supply, S2, try to make them exactly the same. Now on the first one, draw yourself a downward sloping demand curve that's relatively flat. Find the intersection point, dash it over, call it price P1. Now on the second one, draw a second demand curve, draw another demand curve. This time make it pretty steep. So we're going to have demand sub inelastic on the right and demand sub elastic on the left. In both cases, dash it down, find your first quantity. And now S2, that is the supply plus the tax. That's the effect of the tax. So find where your demand curve intersects your second supply curve. Dash that over, price P2, price P2, dash it down, quantity Q2, dash it down, quantity Q2. In which case, elastic or inelastic demand? In which case, elastic or inelastic demand? Is the quantity effect larger? In which case is the quantity effect larger? Elastic on the left or inelastic on the right? Elastic. So if buyers are very responsive to a change in price, then increasing the price of soda pop by one cent per ounce is going to have a big effect on quantity. But if buyers don't respond much to a change in, in price, then there's not going to be much of an effect on quantity. In which case, elastic or inelastic, in which case do the buyers bear the burden? In which case are the buyers paying more than 50% of the tax? Elastic or inelastic? Inelastic. When the price jumps up a lot, inelastic demand, then the buyers are bearing the burden of the tax. Elasticity has everything to do with who's going to bear the burden of that tax and how effective it's going to be in decreasing the price, decreasing the consumption of soda. Y'all have a great day, and I'll see you on Wednesday.